Well, we are joined by Edem Sinanu, of course. He is an anti-graft campaigner and recently becoming a member of the AU Advisory Council. He joins us for the news review. Adam, first off, congratulations uh, to you. I saw photos of you seated uh, there, I think sometime last week, and I was like, hey, my boss be that too. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And thank you. Adam, I, I don't know what it is, whether it's from my end or yours, but I can't hear you too well. Can you hear me now? Better, much better, much better. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we're grateful for the strides you're making. Anti-graft campaigner in Ghana and now, of course, on a member of the AU Advisory Board on uh, Corruption. We pray that God keeps you rising in this step. But even before we get into the newspapers today, a number of interesting matters have cropped up uh, over the weekend and in the past week from Galamse to the economy to May Day and the calls by uh, Labour for pension funds, among others, to be set aside, and that if there are not going to be any increments in salaries, then there should be no increments either when it comes to Article 71 office holders. We also have that on the technological front, something we're discoursing on today. The fact that a number of SIM cards are linked to people's Ghana cards, and some of them are totally unaware this could create a very grave situation in terms of crime and getting the culprits. Any reflections on any of these that you'd like to give us before we get into the papers? Well, I mean, um, when we talk about the pension funds, obviously workers are concerned about what happens to them when they retire. Uh, it is the business of government to make sure that the institutional arrangements uh, good enough to ensure that people are protected in their old age. Um, and I think that many of these issues, one, uh, if it's not protecting the person, so the values we hold dear as a society are important. On the other hand, it will be about bringing stakeholders to the table so that together we construct systems that provide value for the citizens of this country. Uh, I, I think that a lot more engagement, a lot more bringing to the table of various groupings and making sure that the realities on the ground are discussed uh, will make sure that we make progress. Um, and then the various divisions and, uh, you know, kickbacks, sorry, pushbacks that we experience will be reduced. Right. Well, let's get into the stack of papers now, and we'll start, of course, with the daily graphic. A lot of talk there about the May Day celebration. In fact, prominent on pages 40 and 57, uh, it says, We'll protect incomes, pensions of workers, President Ashua's organized uh, labor. That's one of the major stories there. And then 727 on trial for Galamse, according to the Attorney General and Minister of Justice. We'll bring you details of that story especially on the back of the despoliation, if you like, of our natural resources, land and water resources. Just last week, I shared a video, though, uh, Adam. I don't know what the impunity is. I have seen a video in the past about nighttime galamse activity going on, and they were saying, well, <laughs> if you try to apprehend us during the day, how about the night? We are here. And we are working. This was sometime last year. I'm sure you may have uh, seen that as well. There's a recent one where some young thugs, that's what I'll call them, have uprooted an odum tree. And they are saying, well, we're here. You're saying you're fighting Galamse and the rest. But we are here. It's broad daylight. We're doing Galamse. We are destroying the environment. In fact, the sort of... They were almost saying this with pride, Edem that they were destroying our land, destroying our water, they were uprooting trees, and that they didn't care two hoots. For me, th that, that is the highest level of ignorance and stupidity as well. But what has led them here? It may be the fact that they have not been able to secure the jobs they need, and so they would want to fall on such avenues and destroy, pillage. They don't care once they make some gains. So uh, I don't know, but for me, it was really mind boggling. Maybe when we get to that story, you can share your reactions. And uh, the banner headline here, turn cathedral into hospital. TUC 
tells government. I found this one interesting because Mr. President was seated right there. And when the camera panned to him, it was interesting, the expression on his face. So let's get into the stories now. We'll start from protecting incomes and pensions of uh, workers, and we'll take it from there. All right, so let's quickly get into that. Uh, the story on page 40 actually uh, isn't there. So let me turn to page 57, uh, rather. So I think the Daily Graphic has mixed it up a bit this morning in terms of the story. So I'll start rather from the cathedral bit, also with the TUC. So the Trades Union Congress has asked the government to convert the National Cathedral Project into a hospital, suggesting a number of actions that the government must take to help improve the current economic challenges the country was facing. The TUC said the cathedral project was not an essential expenditure and it would better serve a purpose if converted into a hospital. Addressing this year's National May Day Parade in Bolgatanga, the Upper East Regional Capital yesterday, the Secretary General of the TUC, Dr. Anthony Yalba, said, we believe that government can lead us out of this crisis by cutting expenditure on non-essentials, including the need to stop spending our hard-earned revenue on a national cathedral. In fact, it will be better to convert that project into a national hospital. Quote, the president has always said he wants to create another Notre Dame in Ghana so we can attract a lot of visitors, but we disagree. In fact, comrades, it will be better to convert the project into a national hospital, he said. Of course, the May Day celebration was uh, on the theme protecting incomes and pensions in an era of economic crisis, our responsibility. And there was talk, again, about the pensions and uh, how they didn't want this supposed alleged second round of a domestic debt uh, restructuring to uh, take place. Of course, the finance minister has come out to say that that was just misconstrued from his engagements uh, with the IMF. Any thoughts on that? Reflecting also on that story where the president says, we'll protect incomes and pensions of workers. I mean, starting with the cathedral project, um, a number of us had indicated right from the beginning that this was a project better managed by uh, civil society and other groupings. And so it should not have been considered as something that the state is funding. Mm. Essentially because you had one religious grouping that was, at the, as it were, at the heart of the matter. And so uh, I think that the, 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 the president and the government should have divested its interest uh, facilitated a process that allowed this particular grouping to get the land and to develop it. Mm. And ideally, it should have been phased. I mean, phases that were small, concrete, manageable, because you know you can raise the resources. Uh, and therefore, the design should have taken into context, uh, into consideration, the level of resources available. Mm. I think that a number of key things went wrong right from the beginning right from the design phase. And I think that it's a good point for serious reflection if the whole thing is not supposed to come apart and, and not get executed at all. Uh, it's unfortunate because sometimes it looks like uh, people are taking a poke at, at the government and the president because for some of us who are Christians, it, it is, it, it's of value. Mm -hmm. However, the way it has been managed has created challenges. And I think that there ought to be serious reflection about what to do uh, going forward, if we really want to do anything really so speaking of active. speaking of any reflection, uh, initially we were told a hundred million. This has ballooned from the last time I recall to over four hundred million dollars that eventually uh, we're going to be expending on this project. I am just thinking as an ordinary Ghanaian, uh, I don't know whether the Lord would put side by side National Cathedral, a house of worship or uh, a place like Notre Dame in, in France. And we saw when it went up in flames, even uh, the world's richest man now, Bernard Arnault, all of such people contributing for it to be refurbished. But in this instance, uh, we're told that those took centuries to build in some instances. It wasn't a, a five-year, 10-year thing. It took a long while. In this instance, we want to do it, bam. And the president supposedly was inspired by God to do this. In the end, though, looking at our hospital infrastructure, for, the, for, for example, 
looking, for example, at the Great Accra Regional Hospital and how much we spent, looking at the fact that we're saying we want Agenda 111 with all these hospitals and the rest, would it not make more sense to expend such funds or channel them towards such projects? I don't know. If, if assuming for some reason the cathedral couldn't be put up, what else? Would you agree that maybe we should use it for a hospital? Because I've heard people say it should be turned into a university. Now some are saying a hospital. What, what is your take, Adam? Data driven. And so you want to do an analysis of the needs of the people. You want to engage them. Uh, it reminds me of the transition between the MDGs and the SDGs. Uh, proud to that we've done a number of national surveys. Mm. Uh, and at the time, we suddenly discovered that between one survey and the next, right. the focus had shifted from jobs to secondary education. And it was very striking. We had done an, a national survey, I think, two, three earlier, and all the emphasis had been that uh, we need more jobs and so on and so forth. It was 2014, 2015, I think just before the elections of uh, is it 2016, uh, we went around and the majority of Ghanaians had moved from the issue of uh, one jobs to uh, we need our children to get into schools. And it wasn't surprising that then the campaign and its language shifted. It is important that any decisions we take be data driven because Ghanaians do make up their mind as they look at what is going around, what is happening in their various uh, you know, spaces. Um, and in my mind, I have no doubt that the state resources ought to be channeled into development. Uh, if you if you want to do cathedrals, let's make sure that the faith group that has a strong belief in this are marshaled to support that. And I think that it will keep the peace of this nation. Mm. Well, let's see how uh, that goes. Uh, government and UN signed five hundred and seventeen million. Uh, dollar development agreement that story is on page 16 and it says the government and the united nations have signed the 2023 to 2025 sustainable development cooperation framework agreement to help strengthen and support the country's developmental agenda a total resource envelope of 517 million dollars is expected to be utilized to finance the un sdcf out of which the $270 million is available, with the remaining $247 million expected to be mobilized through various approaches. Then again, the story, the Galamsey story I made mention of earlier. A total of 727 individuals are current, currently standing trial across the country over their alleged involvement in illegal mining, popularly known as Galamsey. The Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Godfrey Abuadame, has disclosed. According to the AG, the 727 individuals were involved in 117 cases pending before various high courts and circuit courts. In a statement, Mr. Dame said the eastern region accounted for 50 of the 117 cases, 33 in the western region, 23 in the Ashanti region, 7 in the Great Accra region, with the upper east and northern regions recording 3 and 1, respectively. Finally, to quote him, he says, On the average... A typical Galamsey case involves the arrest and prosecution of at least six or seven individuals. Most of these cases are prosecuted in the region in which the assets were effected. My questions to the AG, uh, before you also share your thoughts on that. One, there has been raised this concern. I think last year it became prominent that if you look at the number of people apprehended when it comes to Galamsey, there are so many foreigners, yet you would find a paucity of foreigners who have actually been apprehended or incarcerated. What is happening? We've seen the numbers. There have been charts in the past showing the numbers of foreigners engaged in Galamsey, prominent among them, and I'm not yielding to any stereotypes, the Chinese. But there are people from Burkina Faso, Mali, in the sub-region here. What is happening? How about those numbers? And secondly, Mr. Attorney General, what about the members of the MPP, members of the ruling administration who from time to time in fact, recently, let's not even say time to time, because I've been reporting Whiting's report. How come <laughs> there seems to be no interest in that? My, my thoughts, but over to you, Mr. Sinami. Um, I think that usually it is about the investigation which will lead to identifying persons who are involved in such illegal activities. And then they are detained, they 
get questioned and the process will continue. Mm. Um, and so depending on where the investigation is being done, you're going to pick up a certain group of people. Uh, I suspect, because you know it's not the AG's department that will do the investigation at the police level or the CID level. Mm. Uh, so the AG by itself as a department or unit will not have control over the names and numbers of people who are brought to the attention. So much more properly put, maybe we ought to be asking the police and the CID, where are you going? How come uh, uh, the many foreigners that are reportedly on our land, uh, you know, channeling and uh, um, promoting these illegal activities, we don't see it reflected in those who are being brought before the ages. Um, and you asked a very important point about what is happening about with regard to Professor Frimpon Boatin's comments. I think, I mean, if I remember right, there was a comment by the president also saying that fishing, am I right? There was a comment uh, by the president saying the president at one point also uh, recommended that the police should investigate what uh, Prof. Bob Barton has said. Yes. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah, so I think we should be asking the police service about um, how much effort they are putting into uh, following up on this matter and uh, what information they have regarding all the reported Chinese and other nationals doing illegal mining in Ghana. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that knowing how much, how important this is to Ghanaians as a whole, uh, the police service also be giving us some kind of updates on what is going on in that space and what we could be doing differently. Interesting thoughts you share. I do recall that, uh, in fact, after that report became public, a report that had been gathering dust for about two years anyway, uh, there was talk from the Jubilee House in a statement about investigations, which is why I say that, yes, uh, corroborating that Mr. President did uh, approve of that. And we're all curious as to how that will end, because uh, from where I sit, some of the names I saw in there, I, I found them to be very troubling in terms of their prominence and their association with this. But we do know that the president's cousin has taken on Professor Frimpong Boateng. You're aware he's suing him for 10 million uh, Ghana cities for defamation. I, I, I'm hoping to see how that pans out in uh, court. Anyway, on the back page of the Daily Graphic, Chief remanded over forged land document and a court of appeal judge donates library to Adafo. Uh, community. I, I, I see this too often. So they've written here appeals court. It's the court of appeal or the appellate court. Uh, this bit about saying appeals court actually isn't technically so-called correct. Well, let's get into the Daily Guide newspaper. Japanese PM arrives in Ghana to deepen ties. It's the second time in, what, some two decades or so. 119 Dalamse cases in uh, courts nationwide. Uh, Joe Gatti pointed to their there's also MPP Canada roots for Joe Gatti. And then Alan shakes MPP with a Drew was so walk in Accra. Then there's government working to ease economic challenges of workers. Let's get into the major stories. So thousands of sympathizers of the ruling New Patriotic Party over the weekend took over the streets of Accra to walk with flag bearer hopeful of the party, Alan John Quejo Tremating. The health walk dubbed a Drew was so health walk, which has already been held in the Ashanti regional capital of Kumasi, drew several party members from all parts of the country. The massive turnout at the walk for Alan Trebating raised hopes among some party supporters that the former trade and industry minister was capable of winning the upcoming presidential primaries of the NPP. Uh, let's also look at uh, the story. If we've done Alan, how about we do some uh, Joe Gatti as well? And the New Patriotic Party Canada branch has expressed confidence and presidential candidate hopeful Joe Gatti's ability to lead Ghana to prosperity as president. As such, the Canada branch of the MPP has declared its unwavering support for the candidacy of Mr. Gatti. Recently, MPP Canada branch held a town hall meeting with Mr. Gatti, former Attorney General and Minister of Justice, and aspiring MPP presidential aspirant. When, when, I'm sure you've seen some of these aspirants and the commentary, things that uh, Dr. Akotoe Freer, for example, has said about agriculture, and people have said, but you were sector minister. And uh, the response has been, look, I didn't have all the power 
I wasn't clothed with the power to do all the things I wanted to do. Um, when you listen to the rhetoric of all of these aspirants, so to speak, what, what leaps out to you? Are, are you encouraged that we could see anything be better? Because these people have been in administration in and out. Are you expectant, Adam? Well, straight off, let me say that I am unhappy with a political campaign that starts in virtually the first quarter of the year before the election, which means that you're going to have about two years of running around. Mm. And that contributes to the uh, levels of expenses on, on campaigns. And then people feel that they must get this money back when they get into government. My take is that we should have the kind of constitutional changes that insist that the political season is just six months of the year in, 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 in respect of where we are going to do the election. So if it's 2024, then it's from July uh, or June, because perhaps you need to stop in November to have your elections. I think that having two Wait, years... Wait, so are you election, suggesting it should start in the electoral year? So let's say around June, you cap off in uh, November, November, right before the election. That's what you're saying? Okay. But can you imagine the amount of they are going to rake up between now and then. Mm. So it's it's not exciting for me to see them starting with marches, walks, etc. I, I begin to worry already about the implications to the next government, whichever party wins. So uh, I'm not excited. Two, to be honest, if you've been in government and we cannot talk about a track record of achievement and successes uh, that stand out, I don't think you deserve to be on a platform uh, telling us that you were not given the opportunity. Um, I don't know. Somehow, I'd rather we have fresh voices, fresh faces, people whose past we can go through, do some due diligence, show that wherever they have worked, they have, you know, allowed the unity of the team to continue. They have chopped achievements that are substantive. They have the capacity to lead with honesty and integrity. They understand hard work. Uh, I like candidates where we can clearly say that these are movers and shakers with a track record of honesty and integrity, and they can bring a difference. So at the moment, probably I'm neutral. I, I don't think I'm excited. Are you, are you saying you don't see any of those in, I mean, those who have been going around for the MPP, for the NBC? Uh, at least we're talking about the MPP now, but for that party, are you saying you don't see any people who display such traits, honesty, integrity, uh, the sort well, of... Well, I'm not, that saying sort of... Don't see. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I don't see. I'm saying that there's a combination of things. One, I think people are starting to campaign too early and they're ignoring the issue of costs, which they will have to pay back because then you have a hole you want to fill. I don't know whether they're keeping that in mind as they start at this point. That's a major concern for me. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a drawdown on, on even accepting the candidacies that are being positioned. Uh, I think the second issue is, whilst you were in government, what have you done? And then the third issue for me is uh, honesty, integrity, what have you. I'll need to make time to look at each of these candidates and find out uh, whether they meet my criteria. But at the moment, honestly speaking, people campaigning don't bring me any excitement. Mm. There's also the story, Japanese Prime Minister arrives in Ghana to deepen ties and Fumio Kishida has arrived in Ghana on a state visit with the goal of strengthening the already close economic ties between the two nations and promoting trade and investment with Ghana as one of the major economic hubs in West Africa. After surviving the COVID-19 pandemic, this is the first visit by a Japanese prime minister to Ghana in 17 years. And Mr. Kishida is happy to be in Ghana as part of his tour of Africa. That's the story there. On the back page, referee has a gender against Liverpool and uh, Klopp has reignited his feud with uh, referee Tierney. Uh, of course, they managed to come from about three goals behind, I think, to beat uh, Tottenham in their last outing. And there's also players beg for ignoring fans. The Leeds United players say they can't express how sorry they are. That's in uh, sports. Any reactions or can we move to the Finder newspaper, uh, Adam? Hello, Adam. On to the next. Okay, let's move on to the next one. 
I can break the eight and unite citizenry for growth. That is according to Alan Kojo Chermartin. Then there's the EPA boss calls on national chief imam to lead crusade for environmental safety. There's also many subscribers angry as they discover unknown phone numbers linked to their Ghana card. I was making mention of that. I'll, I'll reiterate and I go back to that story. Professor Frimpon Boateng's accusation against Opon Kruma is without merit. That's according to Primpag. And government will protect incomes, pensions. Of course, we've uh, taken a look at that story already. So I'll focus on the one on pages four and nine. Let's start with page four. And uh, maybe you might have uh, some reaction to the Sudan evacuation as well, as 74 Ghanaians are expected in Accra today. We know of that story. And uh, looking at where you operate from now, you just might be interested in sharing some thoughts there. But many subscribers are angry as they discover unknown phone numbers linked to their Ghana cards. And the fraudulent registration of subscriber identity module, that is SIM cards, is turning out to be widespread. As subscribers dial the short code, star 420 star 1 hash to check the total number of phone numbers linked to their Ghana card. Many have discovered that the National Communication Authority SIM registration has exposed them to identity fraudsters. Some subscribers have discovered that as high as 18 phone numbers not known to them have been linked to their Ghana cards. Angry about the situation, many have taken to social media sharing what they have discovered using the short code. Uh, identity theft is often a precursor to fraud. Now, here's the dangerous aspect of this whole situation. It is that in the event that the numbers linked to Ghana cards without the knowledge of the actual owners are used for fraud, investigations will lead to the arrest and prosecution of the innocent people. When identity thieves strike, most people worry about the headache involved in clearing their names and securing their finances. That's the first story Let's go now to page nine. And there is that story there. President of the Private Newspaper Publishers Association of Ghana, Primpak Andrew Edwin Arthur, has come out in defense of the Minister for Information, Kojopon Kroma, in the wake of allegations leveled against him by former Minister for Science, Environment, Technology and Innovation, Professor Kwabena Frimpong The allegations surfaced in a 37-page report on illegal mining to the Chief of Staff, where Professor Frimpong who was also the chairman, of the now dissolved Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining claimed Opon Kroma had orchestrated a clandestine meeting to plot and bring him down. In an interview on Adum FM, Mr. Arthur clarified that the event in question was a training program organized by Primpag in collaboration with the Bank of Ghana on financial reporting and had no connection to any malicious intent towards Primpong uh, Boating. On top of that, uh, he says, I personally wrote the letter inviting the Honorable Kujopon Krumah. So I think this is a bit of a dead story rehashed because there was that allegation supposedly that uh, Professor Frimpong Boateng felt that was some sort of meeting to hound him, to sort of denigrate him in a way. But the call earlier had been that there was no such intent. I do not know. Um, of course, there is this bit about the, the, the allegations against Opon Krumah being without merit. But I'll leave that to the court system and uh, the investigations, as, as we've been told, to handle those situations. Any reactions, uh, Adam? Have you checked with that short code? I know you, I don't know whether you are in the country yet, but have you checked to ensure that no one is using your SIM cards or your Ghana card for Kululu? I'll do that immediately after this. Um, I, I got back in. Um, um, the, the two have striking similarities. I mean, in the first hand, you have the issue of the SIM cards. Mm -hmm. Now, we were promised, and you remember that the process for the re-registration was a grueling one. Um, it, it was so difficult. Everybody had to try and get all these things redone. And uh, all of a sudden, it looked like there, were, there was a time constraint. Uh, and we're told that, effectively, this is the last time you have to do this. Everything will be resolved. And here we are. Um, I think that if Ghanaians knew that the processes for investigation would be thorough and that persons behind this will be identified and be punished for whatever things they've done against the law, uh, the level of hue and cry would be much less. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you take Professor Frimpong Boateng's comments, um, the report he put out was two years ago, etc. If the investigations had been done right from that point, 
and persons found to have done something wrong had been identified. We would not be where we are today. So there's right. a sense in which our systems need to work for us. Uh, I mean, if I pick my phone and I did this and I found three names attached to it, but I knew that the system in place to identify who has done this, to arrest right. them, it was very sound. I'll just follow the channel. I'll call whichever department is responsible, tell them, look, this is what I've discovered. I'll be waiting for feedback that the additional uh, links have been removed and that um, my phone, will be, my identity will be protected. I'll be very confident. And that's what we want as Ghanaians. I mean, right. we're not suggesting that things may not go wrong, but when they do wrong, when they do go wrong, how do our systems work to ensure that they are corrected and we can move forward? I think that is key. Mm. Um, I, in my view, Professor Fimprom Bwati has raised a number of issues. Some of them may not eventually turn out to be as accurate as he would have hoped, but I think that for a man to put out such information, that is courageous, uh, and he obviously knew that he would have a pushback. And so uh, let's do the best to pick which aspects are accurate and what can be used to improve our systems and the fortunes of this country, and that is what is critical. Let's wrap with uh, the graphic business newspaper. International community committed to Ghana's economic recovery. Global CEO survey West Africa. Details in there as well. Then there is interest rates to return toward pre-pandemic levels. And then tax evasion avoidance imminent. Analysts caution. <clears throat> as new tax regime kicks in, business associations mount pressure on government all those stories on the front page on the back page <clears throat> boxing gymnasiums uh youth employment and economic development that's uh, an article there an opinion if you like by kwame lawe but as we wrap let's just get into these uh, few stories i think i'll start from page 22 as for the international community being committed to ghana's economic recovery they've mentioned that time without number so I'll not get into that. But governments, uh, three new taxes to improve its badly needed cash flow, makes tax evasion and avoidance imminent, tax analysts have cautioned. The experts strongly believe that the excise duty amendment, income tax amendment, and the growth and sustainability amendment acts, which kicked in from May the 1st, would rather impact tax revenue collection negatively. The new tax regime expected to generate an additional 4 billion Ghana cities also threatens the competitiveness of local businesses, particularly those competing with their counterparts from other African countries, leveraging the opportunities under the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So according to these tax experts, this will only exacerbate tax evasion and avoidance and complicate matters for businesses. And finally, on page 22 of the newspaper... So it says interest rates to return toward pre-pandemic uh, levels, but inflation must be tamed. So real interest rates have rapidly increased recently as monetary policy has tightened the response to higher inflation. Whether this uptake is temporary or partly uh, reflects structural factors is an important question for policymakers. Since the mid-1980s, real interest uh, rates at all maturities and across most advanced economies have been steadily declining. Uh, we can get further details when we grab uh, the graphic business newspaper. But that is the projection. Interest rates to return toward pre-pandemic levels, but inflation must be tamed. Any reflections on these, uh, this final batch of stories? Yes. Um, over the last, I think, five, seven years, uh, one of my concerns, and I tried to engage the GRE at one point, mm. is the need to expand the tax net. We have 70% mm. of our working population in the informal sector, 20-30 in the formal sector. You have about 10% in the uh, public sector, formal public, and uh, maybe another 10-20 in the formal private sector. What that means is that the bulk of your people who can pay to the domestic revenue mobilization drive are informal. Now, you are only increasing taxes because you, we have not constructively and intentionally found mechanisms to ensure that the uh, informal sector persons, and often they are even earning much more, making more money right. than the formal sector are making. I think government must take a better and more critical look at how do we bring into the, into the net those in the informal sector. And 
then reduce the levels of taxes. Otherwise, as they have pointed out, really, it's a big dis disincentive to our competitiveness and to making progress as a nation. Right. So, um, Ministry of Finance Policy Unit, uh, General Revenue Authority, many of us who uh, work with livelihoods and understand the workings of tax are concerned that not enough effort is being paid to expanding the tax net uh, because the numbers will far uh, provide the extra revenue we need rather than, you know, these uh, large increases in taxes and that, you know, undermines the progress of various entities that are in the business sector. Mm. Adam, we're grateful that you joined us this morning. And once more, congratulations on becoming a member of the AU Advisory Board on Corruption. Adam Sedanu, of course, an anti-graft campaigner. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your time. All right. And that is how we cap off the news uh, review, but it was brought to you by Endpoint Homeopathic a Clinic. They're offering you free prostate screening, free female fertility screening as well. Where can you locate them? Here in Accra at Spintex, opposite the Shell signboard in Kumasi. Krono here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There is a Tema Community 22. There is Takradi Anaji Estate. There is Techim Hanswa and Esiama Enenzima. I'm sure you want to call them. These are the numbers. You can reach them on 244 Eight six seven zero six eight or zero two seven four two three four three two one. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease, but only the start of sports. Now, there was a lot of action over the weekend, and Liverpool uh, pulling off quite a cliffhanger. Uh, we'll see how the table is shaping out, but uh, that is in the English Premiership and also here in Ghana. A lot more in sports coming your way up next.